Hi everyone and welcome to the next video in the Bobby Fischer series. This time we're going to look at a game that really illustrates the simplistic yet flawless style of play so hard to imitate which made him famous. It was played at the Leipzig Olympiad in 1960 against the Dutch Grandmaster Dr. Max Uwe, who was the fifth world champion. He was a gifted man who was also a brilliant mathematician as well as a very highly regarded chess author. He was easily one of the best players of his day and it was from Alekhine that he won the world championship in 1935 so he was certainly a massive force to be reckoned with. It should be noted too that he was nearly 60 when this game was played whereas Fischer was just 16. The game is entitled Theoretical Scuffle and Larry Evans gives the introduction as follows. Former world champion Dr. Max Uwe had for decades been considered one of the world's leading authorities on opening theory. His book Chess Archives ranks with modern chess openings as an indispensable source of reference. It's no small wonder then when he selects a risky but playable variation. Fischer, however, just a little better versed in its intricacies introduces a nuance on move 15 which ruffles his opponent to no end. To get into the game anyway, Fischer had the white pieces and opened as usual with e4, to which Ua answered c6, which is the solid Karokan defense, against which it's very difficult for whites to demonstrate any advantage. Play continued with one of the book lines, d4, d5, and here Fischer played the exchange variation with c takes d or e takes d5 sorry so that after c takes d5 he can play c4 which is the panov botvinnik attack which at the time he was convinced was the sharpest way to meet the Karokan, according to his notes in my 60 memorable games it remains a sharp choice to this day the basic elements of the middle game often boil down to an isolated queen's pawn situation for white after either d takes c4 or c takes d5. White's d pawn will be left in the center and as it can't be defended by other pawns pieces will have to protect it and to compensate for this weakness white will get rapid development a grip on the square e5 and attacking chances on the king's side. Play continued with the book line knight f6, knight c3, knight c6 and knight f3. Fischer gives an interesting alternative line here with bishop g5 which Botvinnik used himself fairly often and the correct move for black here is e6 getting greedy and playing instead d takes c4 will be punished with d5 knight e5 and queen d4 which is strong for white so e6 now c takes d5 e takes d5 bishop takes f6 queen takes f6 Knight takes d5 and queen d8, and then knight c3. If instead bishop c4, hoping after bishop e6 for queen e2, black has an edge now after b5. So knight c3, and now queen takes d4, queen takes d4, knight takes d4, white castles long, and bishop c5 from black, knight a4, and knight e6. And Fisher's assessment of this position was that black had managed to equalize, which is why he didn't play this line that Botvinnik used with bishop g5 at this stage, and instead played knight f3. And his opponent, Yue, now went into bishop g4 variation, which is the risky but playable line that Larry Evans mentioned in the introduction. And perhaps he didn't want to play e6 before his light square bishop had moved outside of the pawns, but Fisher gives e6 as a safer move at this stage instead. So he now broke the tension with c takes d5, and after knight takes d5 he played queen b3, which maintains the initiative because it adds an attacker to black's knight at d5 which is only defended by the queen although it allows bishop takes f3 wrecking white's pawn structure at the cost of giving up the bishop pair which is uh, what you have played it also forces g takes f3 
and Yue answered with e6 to defend the knight, which is the correct move. If instead knight db4, now comes bishop e3, where best play goes knight takes d4, bishop takes d4, queen takes d4, bishop b5 check, knight c6, and white castling. And here white gets a strong attack for the sacrifice pawn. Black is still largely undeveloped, whereas it won't be long before all the white pieces are involved in the attack, so it's well worth a pawn. So, e6, anyway, is what you have played. And now came queen takes b7 from Fisher, attacking the knight, who now wins the pawn back with knight takes d4. And this is good for white because he's solved the weakness of his isolated queen spawn, and now he has a queen side pawn majority with 2 to 1. And Fisher continued here with the forcing line, bishop b5 check. And uh, knight takes b5 is the only move that doesn't result in mate. And now comes queen c6 check, which is better than immediately capturing the knight back, since it means that black loses castling rights, because there's no queen d7 here because of queen takes a8 check. So king e7 is forced, and now white regains the piece, queen takes b5. And here Yue can continued with knight takes c3. An alternative is queen d7, where Fisher gives the line knight takes d5 check and e takes d5. If instead queen takes d5, then queen takes d5, e takes d5, white castles, and he'll have good play against black's isolated d and a pawns. So, e takes d5. Now queen b4 check, king e8 and queen d4 with a clear advantage to white according to Fisher's analysis. The open g file will be strong and the queen is very well placed at d4 pressurizing both of black's isolated pawns as well as g7 whilst blockading black's isolated queen's pawn and black can't castle and white should be able to build up pressure with ease and definitely has enough compensation for his damaged pawn structure. But Yue continued here with knight takes c3. So now came b takes c3, which is the last book move of the game, because here Yue played queen d7. And Fritz's table base, oh sorry, database suggests either queen d5 instead and rook b8 as alternatives. And Fisher mentions queen d5, saying that after queen takes d5, e takes d5, rook b1 white has a slight edge. So, queen d7, anyway. And now came rook b1, and this is the innovation of the game. Fisher writes, months before the game, this game, I had shown this line to Benko, and he suggested this innocent looking move. Upon looking deeper, I found that, horrible as white's pawn structure may be, black can't exploit it because he'll he'll be unable to develop his king side normally. Adding an interesting observation, it's the little quirks like this that could make like life difficult to a chess machine. Yue, now taken out of his opening book, immediately went wrong, in Fisher's opinion, with rook d8. And also difficult for black is queen takes b5. So after rook takes b5, uh, king d6 pretty much forced because of the threat of rook b7 check followed up with bishop e3 winning the a pawn and moving the king back to the first rank is less advisable again because of rook b7 with uncomfortable pressure against f7 and a dangerous rook on the seventh rank so play might continue here rook b7 and f6 just to preserve that pawn now king e2 threatening rook d1 check and a decisive second rook on the seventh pretty much forcing king c6 attacking the rook and rook f7 is best and now it's wise for black to free up the movement of his rook at a8 here with a5 and now white has bishop e3 with fisher rights and enduring pull it's going to be a tough game for black and white definitely has all of the positional trumps here and it will surely turn into a squeeze that white should be able to convert into a win with accurate play. Okay, that's the end of part one.